Hello, people and friends of the river. It is so good to be gathering here with you this day. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Dale, Pastor Dale Mellenberg, and it's my pleasure to be uh, speaking with you here today. I'm sorry that I can't be there here in person, uh, but you know, <laughs> COVID. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about something that is near and dear to my heart, and, and, and I pray that it is uh, close to yours as well. I'd like to start with a question. What's in a name? Uh, let me begin with what's in my name. My name is Dale, and, and uh, I've come to understand that it means valley, but let me give you a little more history. I was named Dale because I have an uncle in Holland, and his name is Tala, T-H-A-L-E. And so when my parents immigrated to Canada, uh, some 10 years later I was born, and then they decided to call me after him, and they named me Dale. So, like I said, my name means valley, and I found myself growing up, my boyhood, for the most part, was spent in the valley, the valley of McKinnon Ravine that flowed right from 149th Street all the way down to the North Saskatchewan River. I would find myself in that ravine often, in that valley, um, afternoons, uh, especially on weekends. Uh, I'd be there with friends. We would be riding our uh, bicycles on what we called back then monkey trails. We would call them mountain biking trails today, but we called them monkey trails. Uh, in, this, in the winter, we would be there for tobogganing, uh, either directly in McKinnon Ravine or Government Hill, right behind the museum, often spending a lot of time at the museum. Uh, and so I just kind of grew up in that valley valley, I would say. And then as I grew older into an adult, I found myself in valleys of a different nature. I found myself in spiritual valleys, in emotional valleys, in perhaps physical valleys as well. And, and what I discovered in that is that Psalm 23 really spoke to me about, you know, the Lord is with me in those valleys. And, and I discovered that the soil is actually quite rich there in the valley. And, and, and so those valleys have come to form and shape who I am and, and, and the Lord with me and, and knowing that I, He was with me in the valleys. It just helped to, to really give me a, a good sense of my identity, of who I am. And so I kind of live into my name now of uh, the valley. Two years ago, uh, my second grandson was born, and uh, when he was born, our son announced his name as Brayden. Well, I, I, I gotta be honest with you, I was a little disappointed. I was hoping to find my name somehow, you know, being attached to a, to a grandson, and now this was the second grandson, and I was hoping that it would be, you know, part and parcel of his name. <laughs> and then to add further to my disappointment was the fact that uh, Braden's grandfather on the mother's side, well, his name is Brad. <laughs> So maybe you can understand my disappointment in the fact that he was named Braden. But my son went out of his way to pull me aside and say, you know, Dad, I, I want you to know that the Celtic meaning of Braden's name is, you're probably guessing it, <laughs> Valley. And so, Dad, we specifically chose a name that would speak to both grandfathers, Brad and Dale. And so please know that he is named after you as well. Well, that just kind of brought tears to my heart and, and joy. And, and you can imagine, you know, the pride, in essence, that it instilled in me, not just in my grandson, but more so in my son and his wife as they thought really long and hard about how to name uh, their second son. So I share all of this with you because I'm asking the question, what's in a name? What's in your name? What is in the name the river? That's what I would really like to address here today. What's in the name the river? Now, before we dive into it, so to speak, uh, let's just pause for a moment of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father and gracious Lord, we uh, pause, we just uh, acknowledge your presence here with us, and we pray that uh, you would reveal yourself to, uh, to us through the text that we have chosen today, and uh, that not just uh, you would be visible, but Lord, that we would also discover who we are as we stand before you. Uh, would you do that for us here, gathered this day? Amen. <clears throat> 
I'd like you to take you to uh, Ezekiel. You know, Ezekiel is one of the major prophets in the Bible. It's called a major prophet because it's a fairly lengthy document, a uh, book that he wrote, uh, kind of like Isaiah and Jeremiah. They're called major prophets, more so for that reason. I mean, they have good message, don't get me wrong, and sort of the minor prophets, but, but Ezekiel is a what they call a, a major prophet. And he paints a picture of a river that flows from the temple of God. A river that, that, that grows deep, you know, from ankle deep to knee deep <laughs> to waist deep to so deep that you have to swim in that river. Now, this river is flowing out of the temple. It, it comes out of the south side from the underside, but, but this river is flowing eastward. The temple faces eastward. The river goes out from the temple, out from the south, but it flows eastward. So let's read the text in Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 12. Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 12. This is Ezekiel describing a vision that he had. And he continues to say, The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was flowing from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. A thousand cubits is about 1,500 feet. And then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and he led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and he led me through water that was up to my waist. And he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river where I, when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, which is the uh, Jordan, and where it enters the sea. Now he's referring to the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Englim. There will be places for the spreading of nets and the fish will be of many kinds like the fish in the Great Sea. And, and by Great Sea, he's referring to the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the rivers. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Ezekiel 47 verses 1 to 2. Revelations also depicts this same river. At least I suggest to you that it is the same river. In Revelations 22, the river is now flowing within the city of God, which is uh, referred to as the New Jerusalem. Let's turn to that. Revelations 22, verses 1 to 5. And here is another vision, this time given to the Apostle John. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. 
Thus far, the reading of God's word here this morning, and all God's people said, Amen. Both rivers that are depicted, Ezekiel, Revelations, both rivers are flanked by the trees of life. Ezekiel says that there are many fruit trees on either side of the river, and these trees offer their fruit 12 times a year, and the leaves are good for healing. Revelation says that there are two trees, you know, two trees, one on either side. And likewise, these trees have 12 harvests per year. And likewise, their leaves are good for healing, for the healing of the nations. Lou Vandermeer, uh, the professor teacher of the God Wins study series, um, he states that the river in Revelations is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Ezekiel. Lou then further suggests that the river is a picture of the church, the church flowing from the temple of God, the church flowing within the city of God, the church flowing with trees of life on either side of it. Now, I'd like to take a closer look at this river. <laughs> I am curious. I'd like to look closer to see if there is any resemblance to church. As I look at the river, there are two initial aspects that I would like to draw your attention to. And the first is the church. The first is that, that the revelations, in revelations, the city of God is where we find the river. And the city of God is built on the foundations of the apostles. Revelations 21 verse 14, which we did not read, but, but says, The wall of the city has twelve foundations, and on them are the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The apostles, the disciples, the ones that started the church. So this, both Lou and I suggest to you, is suggestive that the city of God is built on the church which the twelve apostles went out to build. The New Jerusalem, the city of God, which will be our eternal home, is the result of the work of the apostles in going out to all nations. The New Jerusalem, the city of God, is the result of the church making disciples wherever the Spirit sent them. You and I, disciples of the apostles' efforts, disciples of Jesus Christ, will be gathered up into that city of God that is founded on the work of the apostles. That is the hope to which we look. Are you catching the significance of this? The new heaven and the new earth and the gathering of all the saints are the direct result of each and every church that ever has been and ever will be. Church is an important factor in the intentions of God for the world. The second aspect that I'd like to highlight for you is about the river and that it is flowing eastward. Eastward, Ezekiel says, the river is coming out the underside, but it is flowing eastward. Eastward is the direction that the temple faces. Now, have you ever noticed in the Old Testament that the gates of Eden were facing east? Genesis 3 verse 24 says that after God drove mankind out of the garden, he placed them on the east side of the Garden of Eden. A cherubim with a flaming sword guarded the way to the tree of life. The garden faced eastward. Later on in Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve and all of humanity after them continued to move eastward. Genesis 4 verse 16 says, So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Eastward is the direction that humanity spread, away from God, symbolic of moving away from worshiping God, they moved eastward. In Genesis 11 verse 2, sometime after the flood, we read that as men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and they settled there. And there they built the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel has since become the pinnacle of depicting the waywardness of humanity away from God. East of Eden, away from God, they tried to make a name for themselves. And from that place, God scattered them all over the earth. East 
is the symbolic direction away from God. And yet east is the direction that the garden faces. And east is the direction that the temple faces. East of Eden, east of the temple, is where you will find the river and the trees of life. East is the direction in which the river of life flows. And the significance of that is that it symbolizes the direction in which we, the church, are to flow. So the two aspects that I wanted to highlight are these. First, that the Revelation city of God is the direct result of the apostles and where the church, that is the river, is now flowing within the city of God. And second, the Ezekiel river of life is the church flowing eastward towards all of humanity. Put these two together, and I think we begin to see not only our purpose for church, but also what we are to be doing as church. The church is to be going out from the temple of God. That is the purpose of church. The church is to be bringing life to all of humanity. That is the doings of church. And the church participates in the mission of God when it works eastward into fallen humanity. So the river is the church in God's redemptive plan to reach all of humanity, which brings me to three more details that I would like to point out. Three more details before we see how all of this lands on the ground, before we see how all of this applies to us. So let us look at the three depictions of life as shown in the text. The first aspect of life is depicted by the trees. Originally, in the Garden of Eden, there was only one tree of life, and in Ezekiel, there are many trees of life, and in Revelations, there are two trees of life. Collectively, these trees symbolize the life-giving nature of the church. The trees, the trees get their nourishment from the river's water, and the trees give fruit for food and leaves for healing. The river is the second aspect of life depicted in our text. And we know that Jesus is the living water. He is the waters within the river. And then Ezekiel it says that this river, this water of life, will revive that which was dead. <laughs> the dead sea will become fresh and alive again. <laughs> Swarms of living creatures will live where the river flows. People will stand along the shore and reap life food from the river. And I imagine people of every tribe and nation coming to the river, all excited and throwing out their lines, eager to catch fish. The river of life is full of life. Fish. And thirdly, it is the river that gives life to the trees of life. Can you see the effect of the river on life? <laughs> to use the words of the angel, sons and daughters of humanity, do you see this? <laughs> Isn't it great? The river is the church, and God uses the church to bring the life-giving water to flow east to all of humanity. This is our purpose as church, to flow eastward. The river is the water that causes the trees to live, and the trees are to give its fruit in season, and to give their leaves in and out of season. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. But this is the doings of the church, to share of the life that we have been given. Yes? Can I hear an amen? Yes, thank you for that. So let's summarize quickly. Three things that we know about church from our text. First, the church is the tool of God's redemptive plan. Second, the church is to go out to the nations eastward. And third, the church is to bring life everywhere it goes. Do you see this? Now, I wonder, if you wonder, <laughs> are you wondering what I'm wondering? How are we doing in comparison to this depiction of church? Is the river metaphorically facing east? When we scatter after our Sunday gatherings, do we see that we go east towards all of humanity? Or, to ask it another way, 
where in the river of life are we? Are we ankle deep, you know, just splashing about, you know, not going very far into the water. We're just, you know, playing a little bit. Or are we knee deep, you know, wading out, perhaps testing the water just, just a little bit more. Or are we waist deep, <laughs> you know, <laughs> venturing past the point of shiver. <laughs> and you know what I mean by that point of shiver, the shiver point. B because the reason we're at that shiver point is because we are looking to go deeper. Are we so deep that people can swim in the river? I'd like to answer this question with how. How are we to bring life to those who need it? The depiction of the river in Ezekiel provides us with three images of how we, the church, can bring life to all of humanity and all of its eastwardness inviting them back towards the West, if you will. The three images are fish, fruit, and leaves. Fish. Are we bringing fish for food to those who are hungry for life? Are we offering the resources that God has given us and are we offering it out to the world? The river of life is full of life, drawing all of humanity towards it. They can't help it. They are attracted to this life-giving river. They come for the fish, uh, for food that the river offers. You know, the preaching of the words of life, uh, hospitality, doing life together, to name but a few that the river offers. On a personal level, how are you offering your time, talents, and treasures? You know, the resources that God has given you. How are you offering that to others? And then fruit. Are we using the fruit of the Spirit of God so that God Himself can breathe new life into people? Can anyone tell me what the, the nine fruits of the Spirit are? You know Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23? I, I hear some of you already saying it, right? The, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do we have this fruit in our lives? If not, why not? And if we do have this fruit in our lives, then is it visible to others? You, you know, the way that God intends to use us is by demonstrating that He is God in and through our lives. So, are we a people that demonstrate forgiveness and compassion, hospitality, fidelity, contentment? If others can see this in our lives, then they will know that there is a God in heaven. And God can begin to work in them with His life-giving Spirit. Where the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden was appealing to humanity, it offered death. Now the church is to be appealing to all of humanity, offering the fruit of the tree of life. God is redeeming the fruit for His purposes. Do you see that you have been redeemed for God's purposes? And lastly, leaves. Are we bringing the leaves of the trees as a healing balm to the nations? If there is one thing that I would say that our nations need healing in, it is in relationships. God has designed us for relationships. First of all, with Him, and then with each other. Uh, the one must be first before we can truly have the other occur. Too often the church has offered programs for consumption like a transaction that is superficial. We need to move towards ministries of relationships where the river flows deep and strong. God has been wooing us ever since creation. Do you know this? God wants us to be in relationship with Him. Every story in the Bible speaks volumes of His love and His compassion, displaying His intentions for the world. And I am telling you that the world wants it and needs it, but they may not know it. And that's where we come in. 
Church and our relationship with God and with each other is a healing balm for all nations. And at the risk of being redundant, if others can see this in our lives, then they will know that there is a God in heaven. So what's in a name? What is in the name the river? I hope you have been seeing yourselves in the river of life. As I gaze upon the history of the river, I see that you have offered life in many forms. Worship and preaching the word as a given at the heart of the river is a desire to expand God's kingdom here on earth. You have planted four churches, which takes courage and sacrifice. You have offered people a place to belong where, where, they, can be, where they can contribute, where everybody knows their name. You have suffered alongside those who suffer injustice. Through your social justice network, you have given people dignity and value. You have given them life. It seems to me that you have captured well what it is that the Lord requires of us. Micah 6 verse 8. To live with integrity, to, to love with mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Church is God's design to reach all of humanity, and we are the church. The river is the river that carries life to all peoples. And that life is Jesus Christ. We bear witness to Christ in all that we do, to all those around us. And the church, that is us, the river, demonstrates that life by our fish, our fruit, and our leaves. May we be so blessed. And at the risk of using lyrics from an oldie but goodie song, uh, Shine Jesus Shine by Crystal Lewis, and I'm not sure if it's a hymn, and Josh, forgive me, but the lyrics go like this. Flow, river flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. May we be so blessing. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, you have shown us what church is to be all about. You have shown us your purpose. You have shown us our purpose. You have shown us how we are to be the church. Thank you for drawing us into your mission here on earth. Thank you for asking us to be your love and your light to a world in need. We are honored that you have asked us, Lord. We accept. So be with us in our scatterings. Be with us in our daily lives. Help us to shine your light to others, that they may see our lives and that they would know with certainty that you are our Father in heaven. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to show us how to live. In his name we pray. Amen. I'd like to draw from uh, James 4, verse 8, where it says, Draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. Do you catch that flow? Uh, draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. And so it has become one of my favorite sayings of, of blessings and, and well-wishings, if you will, is that, is that may you always find God finding you. So go now, swim in the river of life and bless as you have been blessed. Amen. Until next time.